In this video, when we use the term system, we're not referring to any particular political, cultural, or religious system. Instead, we're referring to what seems to underlie all of these, what drives a multitude of human behaviors and mental states like anger and anxiety. It's essentially the enslavement to the whims of our environment. As we reflect on the human condition, it becomes apparent that many of us are significantly influenced and controlled by the world outside ourselves. Our happiness often hinges on getting what we desire from this external world, and conversely, we experience sadness when it takes things away from us. The approval and disapproval of others affect us profoundly. Praise uplifts us, while dislike makes us miserable. Interestingly, the more we desire something, the more we're willing to sacrifice to obtain it. Conversely, the more we oppose something, the higher price we're willing to pay to avoid it. These cycles of desire, aversion, love, hate, like, and dislike leave us in a perpetual state of fear, making us susceptible to manipulation through shaming, blaming, and the allure of external entities like large corporations, political parties, and cults, all seeking something from us. In this way, the world governs us, dangling carrots on sticks like a donkey rider, and most of us obediently follow from birth to death, much like cattle. However, what if we were to reject the carrot? What if we chose to escape this system? The ancient philosophy of Stoicism revolves around attaining freedom from the whims of our environment. It's important to note that achieving freedom from this system doesn't involve destroying our surroundings. The external world isn't to blame. The universe functions as it does, and while we do have some influence, we ultimately cannot control it. The outside world, with its inescapable conditions like sunshine, rain and wind affecting a farmer's crops, imposes itself upon us. These conditions aren't the system, rather, it's our enslavement to them that constitutes the problem. So, why do we allow the waves of fate to swiftly sweep us away? Why do even the smallest misfortunes and bits of luck manipulate our emotions like puppeteers? Epictetus, a Stoic philosopher, provides insight into this. Men are disturbed not by things, but by the principles and notions they form concerning things. For instance, Death isn't inherently terrible, as evidenced by Socrates' perspective. The terror lies in our perception of death as something terrible, hence when we face hindrances, disturbance or grief, we should attribute it not to others but to ourselves, to our own principles. The system operates as long as we feed into it. The more we attribute tragedy and fortune to what's natural and beyond our control, the more our emotional state is determined by chance. Fortunately, Stoicism offers us invaluable wisdom to break free from this system. Here are seven Stoic principles that can guide us in replacing a highly vulnerable, erratic and tumultuous way of living with a peaceful and liberated existence. Before we begin, please do verify if you're subscribed. And as usual, don't be weak. Stay until the end. Don't miss the chance to master your emotions. Grab the self-knowledge ebook now. Click the link in the first pinned comment and unlock your true potential. Number one, maintaining cheerfulness, regardless of circumstances. How much time have we wasted hoping for favorable outcomes and dreading the arrival of unfortunate events? How many hours have we spent in tears because the future unfolded differently than we had envisioned? Humanity has become adept at grappling with fate and consequently enduring the inevitable pain it brings. Our resistance to uncertainty has become a lucrative industry, and our fear of adversity provides an opportunity for exploitation. Many attempt to sell us promises for the future, offering illusions of safety, protection for ourselves and our loved ones, and guarantees of avoiding unpleasant experiences. As slaves to our preferences and aversions, we try to outsmart fate by manipulating our surroundings to ward off misfortune, However, we cannot lock every door in the vast mansion of life, nor can we patrol every street and alley of reality. 
Despite investing substantial time, effort and money in protective measures, fate always prevails. Therefore, true escape from the system lies in accepting whatever comes our way, instead of paying a hefty price to futilely resist the inevitable. By embracing this perspective, we are less likely to allow others to capitalize on our fears and will experience less disturbance when adversity strikes. Seneca eloquently stated, Why then should we be angry? Why should we lament? We are prepared for our fate. Let nature deal as she will with her own bodies. Let us be cheerful whatever befalls and stoutly reflect that it is not anything of our own that perishes. Number two, diminishing concern for reputation. Stoics view reputation as a preferred indifferent. It's pleasant to possess, but not essential for happiness. Moreover, like anything external, reputation is ultimately beyond our control. Some individuals spend a lifetime meticulously crafting a good reputation, only to see it shattered by a single misstep. Conversely, others lead lives of misconduct and complete disregard for their societal standing, yet they suddenly attain fame and admiration by chance. The conclusion is clear. Reputation is as capricious as the wind. The more we value our standing, the more we become reliant on the opinions of others, which are inherently unpredictable. Additionally, when we overly concern ourselves with others' opinions, we make ourselves susceptible to manipulation and exploitation, ultimately becoming enslaved to the environment. Epictetus argued that our desire for a good reputation should not hinder our mental well-being. If necessary, we should be willing to accept things like shame, blame, exclusion, and ridicule, if doing so allows us to attain tranquility and freedom. These latter states are within our control, and thus unaffected by and independent of the opinions and judgments of others. Number three, developing the skill of endurance. Most of the time when we find ourselves in an undesirable situation, our immediate inclination is to seek a quick escape. However, this is not always possible. Consequently, we often resort to complaining, lamenting and feeling miserable, believing that we are entitled to a better circumstance. In truth, we are not fundamentally entitled to anything, and many times, the best approach to handling a situation is to endure it. How often have we strayed from our chosen path, betrayed our moral compass, or compromised our values simply because we were averse to enduring pain? Pain wields great power, compelling good people to engage in unethical behavior or refrain from performing virtuous deeds. Pain remains a tool for control, and in our endeavor to evade it, we inadvertently fall into the trap set by those attempting to exert control over us. Thus, we become willing to trade our freedom for a little respite from pain and discomfort. If enduring painful situations proves to be challenging, we can turn to the wisdom of Marcus Aurelius. His meditations teach us that endurance isn't necessarily negative. Endurance can serve a purpose, offering something beneficial to us, even if its consequence might be death. In his words, everything that happens is either endurable or not. If it's endurable, then endure it. Stop complaining. If it's unendurable, then stop complaining. Your destruction will mean its end as well. Just remember, you can endure anything your mind can make endurable by treating it as in your interest to do so in your interest or in your nature. This approach can be likened to Albert Camus' interpretation of the Greek mythological figure Sisyphus. The gods condemned Sisyphus to eternally push a rock uphill. His path to liberation lay in fully embracing his fate, such that his punishment ceased to be punitive. Number four, letting go of people. Strong attachments to individuals can have profound and often detrimental consequences. These attachments can lead us to a point where the fear of losing the person we're attached to starts dictating our lives, compelling us to make desperate moves to avoid the inevitable separation. The love story between Padme and Anakin in the Star Wars prequels vividly illustrates the dangers of unhealthy attachments, showcasing how they invite dark forces to manipulate and enslave us. Palpatine effectively exploits Anakin's fear of losing Padme, resulting in dire consequences. Had Anakin approached love differently, not in a suffocating, fearful and possessive manner, but based on freedom, trust and detachment, the dark side would have been powerless over him. 
Epictetus offers stern but potent advice concerning attachment to things we hold dear, suggesting that we should view them as they truly are, destined to break or perish. He advises us to remind ourselves that our fondness extends to general categories, not specific instances. For example, if we love a ceramic cup, we should understand that it's our fondness for ceramic cups in general. This way, if it breaks, we won't be unduly disturbed. Likewise, if we kiss our child or spouse, we should perceive them as human beings, so we won't be devastated if they were to pass away. Number five, letting go of material possessions. The societal rat race, where people invest countless hours in jobs they despise and endure exhaustive routines, is driven by the relentless pursuit of material possessions. Society conditions us to believe that happiness is conditional, hinging on various external circumstances such as a specific income, social status, a particular group of friends, or a house in the suburbs. As long as we lack these, we're made to believe we cannot be happy. However, we need to question the worthiness of these pursuits. These pursuits primarily fall under the domain where fate and fortune hold sway. Engaging in this pursuit is akin to wrestling with forces we can never truly overcome. In his letter to Lucilius titled, On True and False Riches, Seneca questions the value of these material possessions, the gilded couches, jeweled furniture and the like. Do they genuinely bring us happiness, or are they tools for flaunting a facade of the good life? Seneca argues that our happiness should not be contingent on anything external, whether it's riches like gold and silver, or even the most basic necessities like water and porridge. This perspective renders us independent of external circumstances, regardless of how trivial. Seneca further contends that true freedom is enjoyed not by the person slightly influenced by fortune, but by the individual over whom fortune holds no power whatsoever. He refers to the words of his teacher Attalus, emphasizing that dwelling on these ideas allows us to strive not merely to appear happy, but to genuinely be happy finding contentment within ourselves rather than seeking validation from others. Number six, empowering our responses. When faced with provocation, insults, or any attempts to offend, our instinctive reaction often leans towards anger and hostility. In this way, the system grants others the power to make us feel bad, allowing their behavior to influence our own actions. This inadvertently ties our happiness to the actions of others. Individuals displaying unpleasant traits such as being obnoxious, toxic, narcissistic or psychopathic can infiltrate our lives, much like persistent rain clouds hoping to shower us with their malice, aiming to make us suffer. However, we possess a crucial choice, as Viktor Frankl noted. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. If we respond to these individuals with anger, fear, or hostility, we essentially hand over the key to our emotional well-being. Conversely, choosing to be indifferent to them prevents them from infiltrating our hearts and minds, merely polluting the space around us. By making this choice, we safeguard our freedom and inner tranquility. The lesson here is clear. We are only slaves if we choose to be or fail to realize that we have the power to choose freedom Number seven, embracing mortality. Some argue that the fundamental root of all fears is the fear of death. Similarly to the fear of pain, the fear of death can significantly shape our way of life. The Stoics contend that a virtuous life holds greater significance than a long life. While we have no control over the length of our life, we do possess agency over the quality of the life we lead. Fearing death might lead us to exist merely to avoid it, rather than truly living and making life exceptional. This fear prompts us to constantly evade even the slightest hint of danger and seek circumstances that provide an illusion of safety, turning us into anxious sheep following any shepherd promising another day of light. However, no shepherd can save us from life's inevitable consequence, the disintegration of our perceived selves and the return of our physical bodies to nature. Fearing death is futile and worse, dangerous, potentially preventing us from living courageously and virtuously. Marcus Aurelius argues that death too is a natural occurrence, akin to growth, maturity, or the first gray hair. 
Everything comes into existence, passes away and transitions. A thoughtful person should anticipate death not with indifference, impatience or disdain, but by acknowledging it as one of life's inevitable events. In the same way, we anticipate a child's emergence from its mother's womb. We should await the hour when our soul will emerge from its earthly vessel. And that's it for today. I really hope you liked this video. Please be sure to check out the ebook here in the pinned comment. I guarantee you will like it. If you've made it this far, comment something so I know you watched until the end. For your attention, thank you very much. May you be with the Creator.